calls. <clears throat> and then uh, when he finished boot camp, he got transferred to San Diego for school for four months. Well, I think there were some phone calls between the two, not too many, because that was expensive in those days. And uh, anyway, uh, after six weeks, he decided to hitchhike up to Oakland to see her and did so, which kind of impressed her because she figured that if somebody's going to do that, well, they just have a little interest. <laughs> so, anyway, at the end of uh, training, uh, four months, the sailor got uh, the station back in Oakland, or Alameda, at the uh, Coast Guard boot camp. And uh, since uh, we were back close together. Right? We continued dating, and uh, then he acquired a car, which really added to the convenience, if you will. And so, anyway, uh, we went on, and uh, we got closer. And on September the 12th, down on the shores of Lake Merritt, uh, he asked her if he should propose to her. And she was going to say, oh, wait a while. But she didn't say it quick enough. <laughs> and so he did ask her to marry him. And she immediately accepted. So he uh, had to wait another four weeks, or three weeks rather, to uh, get a ring for her because uh, uh, Coast Guard pay was not very high, <laughs> uh, especially for recruits. I think it's like $68 a month or something like that. So, or no, $64, I guess. Uh, got a slight raise when uh, we graduated that. But at any rate, uh, I continued on. And uh, we were, they were going to wait a year and a half until uh, the nurse had graduated, but as time went on, he decided, well, maybe a year, maybe a year, next summer, maybe. <laughs> so I decided to uh, get married in August, and uh, the nurse being from Biggs, or well, really Bridgley, but her mother was in uh, Biggs at that point, uh, had her mother set some things up. So she came to uh, this church, Presbyterian Church, and set up for a wedding, which was held on uh, August 24th, uh, 1957. In the evening, a Saturday evening, a very warm Saturday evening, somewhat <laughs> similar to what we've been having here. And uh, in fact, so important that they had to uh, keep the candles in the refrigeration until just before the service began. <laughs> and the church did not have air conditioning at that point. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, the, uh, uh, we said our vows in front of uh, uh, Reverend John. Uh, 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 Reverend 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 Rigor? Do you want to see that slide? Yeah, well. Uh, yeah, Rigor, Rigor. And anyway, uh, then we had our reception here uh, in the social hall, which at that point, was 90 degrees from what it is now. It extended out over the lawn. And it has been moved 90 degrees since that time. The other thing was that uh, this picture was taken, the altar was at that end of the church. So it's, uh, I understand that the altar has been, uh, I guess, everywhere. I don't know if it's over here or over here. It's been here and here and one of the other sides, so it's, uh, nobody can decide where they were. <laughs> uh, after the 
service, we left on our own, of course, and journeyed up uh, to Oregon to see my parents and friends and so forth up there. Uh, at the wedding itself, I had three Coast Guard uh, buddies that uh, came up and stood beside me. Uh, nobody else was from my family here at all, so uh, too far from uh, Oregon. So. But anyway, we went up and uh, had a honeymoon up that way. Then uh, came back home and uh, uh, had a little problem on the way. Uh, Going across 299, the fuel pump went out of the car at, on a nice hundred. Well, it was 122 and ready back then. Oh, oh my so, gosh. Uh, anyway, we were about halfway between uh, Arcata and Reading and uh, along the Trinity River, about a mile from, a uh, mile and a half from uh, Helena, which was about 12 people. But they did have a motel, and uh, uh, it was, I hitchhiked into uh, Junction City, and they, which was 55 at that point, people. Uh, they did not have a fuel pump there, but they called Weaverville and had one there, but they were closing, and so the next morning I had to hitchhike with the fuel pump into Weaverville, and they matched it up, and uh, Went back and then we were on our way and went back and loaded up a trailer full of stuff at uh, uh, Bruce Mother place in Bates and on to Oakland. And so we would not set foot in this church for another 35 years and we ended up moving, which we never intended to do, to uh, Red Lake. Uh, because uh, we had the house that we were both white, and Bruce's mother was uh, right across the uh, road from the house, and it was turned out to be good because she had quite a few problems, and we were able to uh, help her through the final years of her life. But so. well, we liked really very much, and have enjoyed, have enjoyed the church. Then, Quite involved for a while, we're slowing down as we age, but uh, uh, basically feel that uh, I feel at least they had been a God's will for us to be together because of all the uh, little things that happened here and there and uh, could have gone the to the other life, if you will, the parallel life. But uh, we're here after 65 years, uh, which was 65 last Wednesday. Uh, we're still together. <laughs> uh, I have a word for the teenagers. Uh, you know, they used to have teenagers back then. <laughs> and, uh, as far as I have been able to determine, there were only two that were teenagers here at this church at that point that are still here. And that would be Ruth Ann and Gary. Uh, so you can look at them and see what's in store for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me move that cord. Ruth, can I have you come up and stand? If you could go back to that picture of them on the altar, uh, <coughs> Ruth Ann, is that the same? It's this. Yes. It's that. No, okay. because it looks like this. Yeah. It looks yeah. like maybe this was moved because okay. if you look at the outline of that and that, it's in that picture. No, it was moved when they switched. So that is the that was That was, what that was over moved. there, but it's in the back of that picture. Yes, but okay. yes, that's the way the that's the way the pulpit was. Right. Down there. Right, but so this was back here. But it, so if we take a picture of them down there with that in it the was background. Only, it was only the, <laughs> the circle. Yeah. Okay. It was only It was only a circle. Okay, cool. Right.
All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Bob. That was awesome. Uh, before we get started, so, uh, you know, I wear different hats, and uh, so today I'm the youth pastor. But before we get started, because we're going to talk about the kids, we're going to ooh and ah about how awesome they are, but, you know, guys or, or kids, if you guys ever had like, you know, if you remember back to the stressful week of like finals week, and you get to that last thing, and you're like... You're at that last day, and you're like, oh, I should feel better, but I'm very irritable. Uh, I'm not in that great of a mood. Today is that day for parents. Yes. So, parents, if you are a parent of a school-aged kid, come up here, please. I invite all the parents. Come on up. <coughs> Joey, come on up. Buddy, come on up. something the other day, or when it was perfectly imperfect, and if I could describe our kids, that's what I would say. They are perfectly imperfect. Kids, can you hear me? All right. So, you guys are just coming out of summer, and you're going back to school, and you come to church here, and we all, like Bob did, it's funny that Bob were to give you guys that wisdom. People are going to give you guys solid advice. And there are some people that give you bad advice. But the thing about you guys is that since you guys know everything, you guys will not take that advice. <laughs> and, and it's not your fault. If you look to the other side, because that's kind of how it is right now, we all did the same thing. You know, one of the things that, that teenagers think is, you know, I, I can't relate to adults because, well, they don't know what I'm going through. And, and adults are like, hey, I want to relate to you because I know what you're going through. And the difference is, is that you're going through it now. And we already went through it. So, it's like the saying, company loves misery. Misery loves company. And, and what that, you know, with, with you guys, you guys are stressed out. You're trying to figure out who you are. Uh, you're going into a new grade, new, new students, new teachers. And you're like, you can't possibly know what it feels like down in my gut, the nerves, or in my head, um, what I'm stressing out about. But we were there. And our problem as adults 
as we're like, we were there. We're giving you advice that's going to help you, and you need to take it and not use your brain and use our brain. And don't go live life because we want to wrap you guys in, in bubble wrap so that you don't get hurt and you don't, get stum- you don't stumble along the way. Well, it doesn't work that way. You guys need to get your hearts broken. You guys need to mess up. You know, one of the things that we talk about in youth group is, you know, my desire for my youth is that when they have to go before uh, the father, they're going through the express lane with the amount of sins that they have, not like me taking the carts like at Sam's Club. <laughs> I want you to have a little hand basket out. This is what I have to answer for. But that's not reality. Reality is is that there is no substitution for experience. And we can tell you till we're blue in the face. Don't do that. Don't date her or him. Just wait on that. Uh, You don't need to experience everything. And (laughs) it's all great advice, but you're like, you're going to be in the moment. And it's not that you're not, you guys aren't considerate or that you don't hear us or listen to us. Is in that moment, this is as far as you see, just to your eyelids. And you're going to mess up. And mess-ups are cool. You know, you've never had a teacher probably come up to you and say, you did really good, you got an A, you did everything perfect. See, I like what you did here, and I like what you did there, and this you did just absolutely great. And and explain it for 30 minutes, right? But if you get an F, you have to spend time with that teacher. To all the teachers in here, spend time more with your A students than you are. Just saying. (laughs) Is that a perfectly timed sneeze? (laughs) So, perfectly imperfect. What I mean is, you know, we talk about this again in youth group and we say, God made you perfect. But you are so far from perfect that it's crazy, right? You're, You're perfect in God's image. Because you were made in God's image, but you are nowhere near perfect because we live here. And there was only one perfect person, and that is God. So, if you guys would take an image of what God intended for us. In the beginning, he made man. And then he made woman. That's two. And that was the first separation. That's where we're different. And we are all supposed to have, if you know, a perfect baby has ten fingers, ten toes, two eyes, nose, a mouth. Arms, inner organs. And so we would say that that is close to perfect. Now, God, God does this thing where He separates us and it makes us special, right? A woman is nothing like a man. We don't think the same, we don't even smell the same. Like everything is different about a man and a woman. The moment that God starts making you special, like somebody with no hand or somebody with no arm, they can do amazing things with one hand. They've made it to the MLB. One-handed professional baseball player 
How many two-handed er, baseball players have tried to make it to the major league and didn't make it? And a guy did it with one. One of the best ways for me to explain this is I, I think of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. We, we are all the same, but we have certain things that make us different. In AA, they all have one common issue, but they're all different. So you are perfect in the sense that God made you guys the same. But it's your differences that make you special. Um, autism. I believe that autism is a gift to allow us to understand True love, or to understand God more perfectly. Um, if you ask somebody with autism a question, they give you the truth answer. There's no, and it's straightforward, and um, you know, think about it, they just know it. We Again, think too much. I remember when Rebecca was, was pregnant and they wanted to do some tests. In this test, you could find out if your kid was going to be autistic or Down syndrome. And, and you're like, no, if I have a Down syndrome kid, if I have something, we want that baby. And that was us, right? Then you have, and the Down syndrome it's, again, it's just a blessing. If you have ever met somebody, they are a blessing. They have the keys to this world, and it's very simple. And they're very special. And they love differently. So they have... They were perfect, right? They, God intended them to have two hands. And two legs and two feet. and But then he made them different, which makes them more special, more perfect for God. It's what separates us that makes us um, more usable for God. So it's the things that separate you, that make you special. Like, uh, you know, I'm short. I've always been short. My daughter's going to be short. And society can you stand over here? Stand, stand right here. I thought, man, my son is tall. Yeah, that's awesome. And then he's like, hey, meet my best friend, Emmett. <laughs> and I'm like, darn it. And I'm like, oh, it's because he's white. Jaime? <laughs> <laughs> And then you're like, hey, who's that new kid? Ryan? <laughs> and then you're like, hey, who's your older brother? <laughs> that way. See, you don't see it. You have, yeah. 
It's funny, when I first met Heba, we were at a football game. And you know how you know how tall I am. <laughs> so I'm sitting there like this and Laura I said, hey, this is my friend Heba. I said, yeah. I said, hey, Heba, nice to meet you. And I said, that's my daughter. My only daughter. <laughs> Yes, you go sit down. <laughs> They're all the same. And they're all very different. The girls are the same and different. They each one have things that somebody else might call a flaw, like being tall. You probably hit your head on things. <laughs> Lorelai, do you ever hit your head on things? <laughs> Less headaches. <laughs> I remember when I was small, somebody like, you know, Emmett or that size would think that they could pick on me and I'd love to fight, right? <laughs> so as being small, I always had to fight. Hefa, anybody ever tried to pick a fight with you? Yep, only your, only your older brother. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Everybody knows that one short guy that's like, man, he's a, he's a fireball. That's because we had to be. It's what makes us special. Everybody has their imperfections that make them special. You know, it's like the voices up here. You guys see it. You have all the higher pitched voices. And then you have the sound over here. It, it's just, it's different. Everybody's different. Everybody, I'm not saying everybody gets a trophy today. I'm just saying that your imperfections are what make this an awesome group. It's just like us. Not just there. It's just like us. The different ages. The different lives. <laughs> you know, um, as adults, as parents, we want to give you guys some of the best advice. And you're not going to take it. But I heard a story the other day, and I thought it was one of the greatest stories in the world. You know, one of the, one of the things that's hardest is, uh, as a parent, dealing with a kid walking in with a broken heart. And you want to say, I told you so. I told you not to date that kid. I told you. You know, be friends first before your boyfriend and girlfriend. Or, I told you to take it slow. Don't fall so fast. And it doesn't matter what we do because kids are going to follow their heart. You know, the story of Romeo and Juliet is a true depiction of how dumb 16 or 14 year old kids are as far as following their heart. They love better, they love pure. They, they see tunnel vision. They can't see life without that other person. It's a love that our wives uh, of men probably are saying, I want you to love me like that. And we're like, I want to love you like that. I just don't know how anymore. I don't know. It, I, it's weird. I have all these thoughts and I have all these. I, I, I can't be 14 years old anymore. So I heard this story about... Uh, Two autistic people uh, going out on a date. And they were coached. So a female and a male. And they were coached. And they went out to dinner. And they ordered their dinner. And, and they had the conversation that they were going to have. And they were both. They both were set up that if the conversation were to go stale. That they had a piece of paper with three things that could be conversation starters. 
So they all, the, the two of them wrote down their three favorite things. And so the conversation got quiet. God bless you. You always sneeze. The conversation got, qu- got quiet, so the, the guy pulls out his, his list. And he says, I want to tell you what my three favorite things are. And he says, I like hot rugs. I like watching sports. And uh, yeah, something else. Airplanes or something. And the girl was sad. And he says, why are you sad? And he says, because I think all three of those things are stupid. <laughs> so he says, okay, what are your three favorite things? So she tells him. And then he was sad. She says, why are you sad? He says, because I think those three things are stupid. <laughs> they paid their bill and never went on another date. You can't change the person that you want to date to be the perfect guy or the perfect girl, right? We need to learn a lesson. You kids need to learn a lesson. Pick the right guy for the right reasons. Pick the right girl for the right reasons. Not the one focal point. You know, I can give you my best advice. And you guys would say, but yeah, you and Rebecca have been together since she was 18 and you were 19. I'm like, that's not everybody. You know, if that were the case, Cesario 17 and Emmett 17, you guys could, not together. (laughs) I realized the leg slap afterwards. So we all go through life, perfectly imperfect. And we get into relationships. And we get our hearts broken. One of the things that happens is we get calloused. And we learn experience through living it. And the next time you go to date somebody, or the next time you go take a test, you had a bad experience, you're gonna change it. Your, that callus is going to help you be better, be, have more discernment. Choose your, your partners better, choose your friends better, study for your test better. These are all experiences. You know, if you guys think that if you don't study for a test, and you go to take that test, you're going to be stressed out, but that's the last time, once you're out of school, that's the last time you have to do it? That's wrong. I've gone to meetings where I'm supposed to present, and I didn't study, you know, perfectly on one side, and I'm, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm stressed out, my stomach's in knots, I get flush. Yes, brown can turn red if, you, <laughs> if I stress out enough. You guys need, and you guys will start to learn some of these calluses. They're going to make you, they're going to turn you into a man, if you're a male. And if you're a female, they're going to turn you into a woman. Bad things happen. Bad things happen all the time, all around us. To us, to our friends. And at the moment, we think that's the worst thing that could ever happen to us. Until the next worst thing happens to us. <laughs> but it's just going to make you callous. I, I would say that, you know, the, what's the saying? Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Everything that happens to you guys is giving you experience. It's giving you a callous. Let's go to Proverbs. Let me 
It says the Proverbs of Solomon. You guys listening? Yeah. Are you listening? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a wise child makes a glad father. But a foolish child is a mother's grief. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> Treasures gained by, by wickedness do not profit. But righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry. But he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. A child who gathers in summer is prudent, but a child who sleeps in harvest brings shame. I mean, that should make sense. We live in a farming community. You don't get to sleep during harvest. <laughs> Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. The wise of heart will heed commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever follows perverse ways will be found out. Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, but the one who rebukes boldly makes peace. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. <coughs> Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. On the lips of one who has understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of one who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the babbling of a fool brings ruin near. The wealth of a rich is their fortress. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life. But one who rejects a rebuke goes astray. Lying lips conceal hatred and whoever utters slander is a fool sound familiar whatever you do don't lie don't lie to me any parents say that just don't lie to me don't waste my time don't lie to me when words are many transgression is not lacking but the prudent are restrained in speech. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The mind of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. 
doing what is like sport to a fool, but wise conduct is pleasure to a person of understanding. Did I say that right? Doing wrong is like sport to a fool, but wise conduct is pleasure to a person of understanding. What the wicked dread will come upon them, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. When the tempest passes, the wicked are no more, but the righteous are established forever. Like vinegar to teeth and smoke to the eyes, so are the lazy to their employers. Don't be lazy. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. But the years of the wicked will be short. The hope of the righteous ends in gladness. But the expectation of the wicked comes to nothing. The way of the Lord is a stronghold for the upright, but destruction for evildoers. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not remain in the land. The mouth of the righteous bring forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked or but the mouth of the wicked what is perverse. So good advice. Proverbs chapter ten. You should read it more. Maybe take it one at a time. So as a, as a teen, as a youth, again, you know, the, the understanding is, well, you're not living it currently. You may have lived it, but things have changed, and you're not currently living it. And I think about these things, and it's not just you kids, it's also us adults. When we're going through something, we may not understand that somebody else who's gone through it will be understanding because our each we're all so different. None of us are the same. So who better to teach us than Christ himself? Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards, he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, you kids will miss your snack and be in a horrible mood. Or if you don't eat right the night before, then you do horrible in your game the next day. And you say, well, you don't understand. My stomach hurts. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Christ understands. To understand this, we don't have to not eat or drink. <coughs> That's not what is happening here. What's happening here is Christ is coming down and experiencing all of your worst experiences and more. He is being tempted with every sin, with every evil thought, with everything, so that he could 
You might be able to say to your dad, well, you don't know what I'm going through. But you cannot say that to Christ. You might be able to say to uh, a teacher, you don't understand the pressure. But you cannot say that to Christ. We're going to get there. Verse 5, it says... Then the devil took him to the holy city, placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus was standing there, the Son of God, and he knows his Father's word. He knows the words that are written. And the devil says, well, if you really are the Son of God, prove it. Jump off of here. It is written. So you might be able to say, well, if you, you've never been in the position that I am. I have to keep up my image at school. People say, oh, you're really good at this. I have to be really good at this. I've been accused of it. I need to do it. Remember, your imperfections are what make you special, are what make you different from everybody else. And differences matter. Differences are the key. Jesus said to him. So the devil's using scripture against Jesus. And Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. You are going to be tested, you're going to be tempted. Sin is going to be thrown in front of you. And it's going to be easy. And you're never going to get caught. And you're going to be able to cheat. And you're going to be able to pass a test without studying. And you're going to be able to make all these poor decisions because it's going to be right in front of you. The opportunity is perfect. Or you get to choose the right path. Chances are it won't be the funnest path. But we just read a bunch of words in Proverbs 10 when you guys weren't listening. (laughs) That separates you. That tells you the blessing and the curse. I tried giving you the study notes before we got to this. Jesus is like you. He was tempted with everything you're being tempted with. Or will be tempted with. And the cool thing is you can talk to him. And you can pray to him. At any time. Any place. In the morning when you wake up, before you go to bed, before a test, 
before class, before dealing with the one person you do not want to see, before dealing with the person you do want to see, before your sporting events, when you go to the bathroom, when you're going from one class to another, when you get caught, when you choose to do the right thing, you can always talk to God. Your prayer life is important. God wants to hear your voice. God wants to hear you cry out to Him. We might say, well, praying in school is you know, not cool. Going to hell is worse, I promise. <laughs> A hundred and twenty-two degrees? That might be pretty close to hell. Isn't that what it was in Reading you said, Bob? Yes. And the hottest day, Gary, you ever felt in Reading was the day you and Nora moved there at a hundred and eighteen? But you weren't there. <laughs> I feel like such a wuss up here. I'm like, it's hot. It's hot. It's probably 76 degrees. Which is... <laughs> 65. So these kids are about to head off to go try not to get dumber, they're going to try to get smarter. <laughs> right? They're going to go learn new things, but we need to pray over them that they would continue to stay as innocent as possible and that they would listen to God. And ask, ask mom and dad questions to continue to involve parents. Um, you guys are going to learn some things that are questionable. I'm not saying question your teachers right then and there, but talk to mom and dad. We have some great teachers. One of them sitting right here. <laughs> so... Uh, if you guys would join me, we're gonna. I'd like to lay hands on these kids as they go to school and pray over them and try to just ask for protection over them and um, remind them that this is their support group. This is family.
Yeah. So scripture says that the laying of hands is a blessing and that we can just lift up these these kids to you. We lift them up that they would know you, that they would seek you, that when they come to a fork in the road that they would just try to follow you, that they would follow the light and stay away from the darkness. But Lord, we ask that you would put a calling on their life to, to serve you and to lead others to the light, Lord. Um, I ask for protection over them. I ask for a blessing over them. Um, I pray for them, Lord, that they would know you more and that going into those schools that they would just band together as a family and understand that their support group is huge and that they have people praying for them all over the world, that they would continue to know who you are and to listen to scripture and their family and obey their parents and love each other and show love to all of God's children. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to serve me, to be their youth pastor, to be their pastor. And um, I just ask that they would continue to talk to me and, and, and allow me to be their youth pastor. Lord, I'm asking that you would bind their minds to you, Father, and not of the world. Lord, bless each and every one of these children, Father, as they walk this year into the world. It is a worldly place, but Lord, keep them close to you and their hearts and their minds to you, Father. I pray over them and their families, Lord. Lift them up, protect them, and keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And Lord, your word says that if you train up a child in the way he should go when he is older, he shall not depart from it. We thank you for your word that is always true, that we can trust you in all times. I ask, Lord, that you would touch each one of these young people with a hunger and thirst for the word of God, and it will never disappoint them. I thank you for the teachings and for the nurture that we've had as a family here in this place. And we thank you for the little ones that are having so much joy. <laughs> we thank you, Father, for letting us know you in this hour and that we would continue to be strengthened to know that we can do this in you and we pray that we would always know that you're proud of us even if we mess up like Jose said. Thank you Lord. Lord I thank you that each child here is made perfectly imperfect but in this imperfect Lord they're walking toward perfection. I pray each one of these children would come to a saving understanding of who Jesus truly is to them, that they can come to Jesus every day of their life. They will be tempted, but they can overcome. We thank you that you are giving this remnant, these children, a sense of purity and love. Run after righteousness, kids. Don't let people trick you. Ask that the truth inside of you will set you free, and it will, and you can get through each year and grow in grace every single day. And even if you have hard stuff happen, get up, dust yourself off, and keep running because you are going to win the race because Jesus said we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. So go run the race this year and be proud of yourself when you have your accomplishments. You can be proud. It's good. Jesus wants us to love ourselves as you love others. And Jesus, we praise you for every single precious one here. May the belief and the trust and the love of the Lord grow ever strong each day. Knock off children's head. Amen.
when Christ, Christ sat, sat with his disciples. They were so ready for Passover. And they were celebrating with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread comes from the Passover. The Passover was in Egypt when the Spirit came over and wiped out the firstborn. And they had to be obedient. And they had to eat bread without leaven. And they had to mark their doorways with blood. And they had to eat a lamb. Their obedience of doing all of that is what saved them. It was very strict rules. They had to eat all of the animal, and they can invite their friends over and then burn what was rest, so the rest of it, what was left over. So we have here bread made without leaven. We practice obedience. <clears throat> now, in the Bible, it doesn't say do this all the time. It doesn't say do it once a week. It doesn't say do it on Sunday. They were celebrating the Passover, but then Christ says, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so to not make it a religious act, and to make it an obedience act, we have gone to when it feels like we need to do it. And today, as a reminder of what it means to be a believer, a follower, a Christian. We are going to have communion. I want you to understand that Christ lived everything you're living and understanding. You can talk to him at any time. And he took all the sins of the world, the ones you make, the ones you will make, all of your bad thoughts, and he carried that cross after being beat up, after being hit with the scorpion, flogged, his crown of thorns. After all that, he was made to carry a cross strong enough that would hold him, tall enough that when put in the ground, he was above the ground, long enough for his hands to be nailed to it. And he said that this was his body, which he gave up for me. And we remember this. He said, this is my body, which is given up for you. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. Now there are some that won't remember the cross, because it's the worst part about Christ. And for us, that's our reminder that we are horrible people and we need him. He sacrificed everything for us. He gave up his place in heaven to come down here for us. He says, this is my body, which is given up for you. He says, do this and remember me.
And it says, in the same way he took the cup. And he said that it's his blood poured out for the remission of our sins. With his body and his blood, the perfect land wiped away sin. His blood is the new covenant. New covenant is Christ. We must follow. We must believe. We must be obedient. Christ's blood was poured out for the remission of our sins. The new covenant. Serve the Lord.